This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to the humanitarian crisis unfolding in the world's largest jail complex, which is located right here in New York City, one of the world's richest cities. It's on an island in the middle of the East River, between Queens and the Bronx. Most of the 5,700 people in the city's jails are held at Rikers Island. Most of them are awaiting trial. Amid skyrocketing violence, staffing shortages, chronic medical neglect, some are calling Rikers a death trap. So far this year, 12 people have died at Rikers, and the city's jails the most since 2016, including five suicides. Wilson Diaz Guzman, Javier Velasco, Tomas Carlo Camacho, Brandon Rodriguez, Segundo Gualpa, Thomas Bronson III, Richard Blake, Jose Mejia Martinez, Robert Jackson, Esaias Johnson, Kareem Isabdul, and Stephen Kadu. Last month, more than a dozen elected officials visited Rikers Island following reports of worsening conditions. This is New York Assembly member Jessica Gonzalez Rojas speaking after touring Rikers. I am admittedly an emotional mess. I have nine pages of mothers to call, of partners to call, of loved ones to call. Because people have been stuck inside for days, for weeks, for months, without a court hearing. I just witnessed an attempted suicide. Miss, come here. Jumped up there and tried to hang himself. Me and Senator Ramos were right there. Nobody deserves this. Well, this week, New York Governor Kathy Hochul and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced they'll transfer most of the 230 women and transgender people held at Rikers to two state prisons, including the maximum security Bedford Hills prison. Again, most of them are awaiting trial. For more, we're joined by three guests. Anissa Sabor was formerly incarcerated at Rikers Island Jail and at Bedford Hills Prison, and is a leader with the HALT Solitary Campaign. Julian Harris-Calvin is director of the Greater Justice New York Program at the Vera Institute of Justice, and Jumani Williams is New York City's public advocate. Last month, he toured Rikers, which he's done since 2008. Welcome you all to Democracy Now! Jumani, let's begin with you. You've said conditions the last time you toured. Rikers Island jail complex were the most horrific you've seen. Tell us what you've seen. Uh, you know, at that point, it was it was just stunning. I, I honestly believe uh, this country would invade another country uh, to rescue people who were living in the conditions I saw. It was really very hard to explain unless you were there. Uh, people just laying in filth. There was one man in a cell that they called a cell was actually a shower, couldn't sit, couldn't stand, couldn't lay down. I didn't know if it was urine or water that was keeping this person wet. Uh, they were just naked. I saw a cell that should have had two or three people with six people. They had a bag in which they were sharing uh, as a bathroom because the toilet wasn't working. People who should have been moved to, within 24 hours were there seven, eight days. There were HIV patients, mental health patients who hadn't gotten their medication in weeks. It was a disaster a disaster for everyone on both sides of those bars, and both of them are actually black and brown. I would point out, you mentioned that Rikers is the largest jail complex in the world, which sadly probably makes it the largest mental health institution in the world as well, which is a whole nother problem. You've said you're concerned that Rikers could explode like Attica. 50 years ago, 1971, uh, when there was a prisoner uprising against the conditions there, and then the New York governor at the time, Rockefeller, called in the uh, state troopers, and they opened fire, killing scores of people. At that moment, when we were there, I actually thought it was imminent, what we saw. Uh, there were uh, uh, people who are uh, detained, literally just walking around. Uh, we did have to see the, uh, the emergency unit come uh, more than once. Uh, we actually saw uh, people who were housed there asking for additional uh, correction officer support. Uh, that's how bad it had gotten. We saw one person who actually got out uh, of his uh, uh, cell shower and was the one handing out the food uh, that was there uh, for some of the other people who couldn't get out. It was a complete disaster and a breakdown. It was very hard to 
express that. And uh, I wish uh, the governor herself actually, I think she should still tour. Uh, and the mayor, it's been a dereliction in duty. Uh, the small visit that he did make, he could have just done from his office, having, speak, having spoken to no one. Uh, it's hard to explain unless you're there. And I'm, I'm sure uh, our guest who's here uh, can tell you even more firsthand. Well, Anissa Sabur, I wanted to go to you next. Um, you were imprisoned at Rikers and at the maximum security Bedford Hills. If you can respond to the new New York governor, um, Hochul, moving about 230 women and transgender prisoners from Rikers, um, we're talking about people who have not even been tried. I mean, the jail at Rikers is for, what, prisoners who are serving under a year prison sentence or are awaiting trial. They're there because they can't afford bail. Well, good morning, <clears throat> and thank you for having me. And, and I just want to say this. First of all, the language is what have them doing what they're doing to people, right? They don't see detainees as people. And yes, I think the governor should have actually went in and spoken to those women and trans women and seen for herself the way the public advocate and other uh, legislators did to see what the crisis is and really how to address it. Moving someone who has not had due process from a city jail where you're detained to a state sentence facility is traumatic. And I'm telling you, because I went through it, they did not move me before I was sentenced. I was detained at Rikers several times, right? But I was not moved to a state facility until I was state sentenced. The state is very different and operates very different from the city. The programming, the access, moving people away from the courts to be able to transport them, it's really hard to get back and forth to court from Rikers Island. Let me say that. In order for a person to get to court, they're woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning, fed a light breakfast, and put into a holding cell until whenever the bus arrives. Some folks don't get to court till noon because of the number of transportation buses that has to come and deliver them to the courts. So imagine being on Rikers in the city, which is just across the bridge from Manhattan, Queens and the Bronx, where the courts are located, and now being sent to Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. The state has not done anything good for the people who are state sentenced. I can't imagine having to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning from Bedford Hills to be fed a light breakfast to travel maybe two, two and a half, maybe three hours if you come from Staten Island to Westchester to get to court. How do your families get to you? Okay, she's gonna provide free buses twice a day. People had access to Rikers all day. It was easy transportation. Now it's they have to travel to another location, get one bus, drive two and a half, maybe three hours to, to Bedford Hills, who knows how long they're going to allow them to visit? Rikers visits were only one hour. The state visits are different, and they were only on the weekends, right? There's no programming in the state facilities right now due to COVID. So how are people going to actually be able to engage in some of the community resources that are out here for them to help them through their process before they get to court? whether it's substance programming, whether it's mental health programming, all of these things are going to be missing now because it's a whole nother process to become a volunteer to bring your program into the state facilities. So this is what I would say to the governor. You need to rethink what you're doing. The traumatic impact that this would have on the lives of these individuals, their families, and their communities. It should not happen. It needs to stop now.
And let's be clear about the racial disparities here. The sentencing project uh, just came out with their report, not only on what's happening in state prisons in New York, but around the country. Um, it said black people are incarcerated in state prisons across the country at nearly five times the rate of whites. And, and that's true. That is a true resourced fact. Rikers Island is full of black and brown bodies, male, female, transgender, gender nonconforming, black and brown bodies from low-income communities in New York City. How do you take them out of the community that they are in and put them in a whole nother? Do you know the community and the, the income ratio in Westchester County where this prison is? I'm surprised it's even there. Bedford Hills is one of the richest counties in the state. So you're taking these people from these communities and putting them in these communities where nobody cares about them. Out of sight, out of mind. You know, people are saying they're going to do other things. They really want to look at what the governor's doing. It's, it's getting them out of Rikers. But there are things in the community right here in New York City, organizations and resources that these women and trans women could have benefited from. The state has three facilities located in New York City that could have been transformed or repurposed to hold these women until something better could have came along. Why put unsentenced people in state facilities? Do you know the pressure that's gonna have on the state correction officers and their union and the fight how people are going to be neglected even more because they're not state sentenced? No programming. The medical in the state is just as bad. Have you seen the report that uh, a Center for Justice just did on the death of the elders in prison, 55 and over? Every three days, there's a death in one of New York State prison facilities. Human lives are being lost on a daily basis. So you tell me this is the best answer? I don't believe it. I'm also thinking— And I won't accept it. I'm also thinking about Laileen Palenko, who died at Rikers in 2019. She was being held there, a transgender, uh, Afro-Latinx woman, being held at Rikers because she couldn't afford the $500 bail. She was put in solitary. Um, she had epilepsy, and she died. And I have been advocating with her sister to end solitary on Rikers. And this just seems like another one of the city and state's uh, shenanigans, right? Where they say, oh, we don't have solitary. We're ending it. But you're still building cages to put human beings in like they're animals. Right? So you, you, you think the solution to, to a crisis in a, in a horrific facility is to take the women and put them in another horrific facility, right, with no real access is going to solve the problem. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. Let's bring in uh, Julian Harris-Calvin. Um, can you talk about the role of bail, the role of prosecutors and judges in sending people to Rikers um, and releasing them from what is described as a hellhole? You're a former public defender. Yes. Uh, prosecutors and judges hold the keys to Rikers Island. They are the gatekeepers, and they determine who goes in and who comes out, because judges are the folks that send New Yorkers to Rikers Island and to any other jail facility in New York City. And the, the bail reform law that was passed in 2019 was responsive to exactly what Ms. Sabor was talking about, that, you know, bail is something that rich people can pay and poor people can't pay. Um, and poor black and brown New Yorkers are the folks that have suffered from that. And so the bail reform law made it so that far fewer uh, folks, mostly black and brown folks, were being sent to, to a Rikers Island on unaffordable bail. But there still are scenarios in which judges can set bail. And they're often setting bail after there's a request by 
New York City district attorneys. Um, and so the folks who are in Rikers Island, most of them, about 4,500 of them, are pretrial detainees. Um, they're people who are held pretrial. They are innocent until proven guilty, but they're languishing in Rikers Island under these conditions simply because they cannot afford to pay their way out. And so what needs to happen, we need to focus on solutions. I think we, we have established that it is horrific on the island, uh, that people are in conditions that sounds like it's some gulag that we've heard about from the Cold War, right? And what we need to focus on now are what are the solutions? And DAs and prosecutors are part of the solution. Prosecutors need to stop requesting bail. They need to stop requesting bail. If they don't request bail and judges release folks, then there are no more people being funneled in to this penal colony that is torturous. And judges need to stop um, you know, being responsive to the bail requests and actually setting bail. So that will stop the funnel on the front end, but we need to get people off the island. So judges and prosecutors and defense lawyers need to come together and make the decision that we are going to reassess all of the people who are on Rikers Island because they're there on bail. And we need to either lower bails and make them affordable, which is required by the bail law, um, or we need to just release them. There's no reason why people need to be sitting there dying. Um, and in the conditions that the public advocate just uh, mentioned and recounted, um, when they, there are other solutions and alternatives. There's um, you know, mental health treatment in the community, which is better than the kinds of mental health treatment we're getting on Rikers Island. There are uh, drug use treatment services, there are employment services, there are all kinds of programming and services that folks can access that are better for them, that are better for our communities, off the island, and they can address some of the concerns that judges and prosecutors might have um, that are the basis for setting bail. What about that place nicknamed The Boat, anchored off the Bronx's southern shore across from Rikers Island? I believe someone recently died there. Yes, The Boat was supposed to be a temporary solution um, to the, the stated need to have facilities for folks who are being held pretrial in the early 90s. When, and in the 90s, there were 20,000 people being incarcerated um, in New York City. And now we're just under 5,600. And the boat is a floating barge. It's, it, it's literally a boat that they have converted into a jail. And when we say that we need to close Rikers Island and we need to get people off the island, that includes folks who are floating in the boat in the East River right off of Rikers Island. And the conditions there are similarly um, bad, and folks need to be t to be taken off of the boat. What about the media's constant repetition, um, Julian, that murder is up, crime is up, that something has to be done? I think part of the reason why the jail population on Rikers Island increased about 40 percent between last summer, when we were at all-time lows of about 3,800 people, to about 6,000 people just a month ago, is because of this fear-mongering and inaccurate rhetoric around bail reform, criminal justice reform, vis-a-vis -vis crime rates. There, We are not at all-time highs uh, in terms of crime uh, and public safety threats in New York City or New York State. Actually, we are on par with 2019's historic lows in terms of crime rates. But it is true, and I think we need to talk about and acknowledge that murders were up and, and shootings, uh, gun crimes um, related to murders too, were up uh, in 2020 and 2021 as compared to 2019's all-time lows. They're still far below uh, what it was like in New York City in the 90s. Um, and I'm sure uh, my co-guests can, can recount what it was like in the 90s um, or even the, two th the early 2000s. So we are still at very low crime rates across um, crime categories. But it's true that in the last few years, gun crimes um, and murders have gone up compared to 2019 and 2018, which were very, very low. And so we need to address those. Again, this is about solutions. And what we know is throwing people in jail is not a long-term solution to gun crime and murders. In fact, we need to be taking um, our investments, some of the two and a half 
billion dollars we spend on the Department of Corrections and, and on jailing people on Rikers Island, we need to take a big chunk of that money and we need to invest in evidence-based solutions to public safety issues. That means credible messengers and violence interrupters and the kinds of in the community programming that where we've seen um, 86 percent drops in uh, gun crimes and homicides in places like Richmond, California. We've seen it here in New York City in Crown Heights where um, after credible messengers and violence interrupters went into the community that they had lower rates in that community of gun crimes and uh, shootings specifically and um, shooting related homicides as compared to the the NYPD we, precinct adjacent to them. We just so have there are, we ahead. just have 30 seconds mm -hmm. but I wanted to go back to Jinamani Williams the New York City public advocate. You formed an exploratory commission uh, an exploratory committee to run for governor. What would you do differently? Well, to the conversation that's going on, we have to at once acknowledge spikes in crime, but we also need leaders who are going to guide New Yorkers through the facts of what's happening and not feed into the fear-mongering that was done 30 years ago uh, when the crack epidemic happened and didn't actually solve the problem, and then people apologized 30 years later. Uh, when we look at where we were at 2018 and 2019, the same people then said we needed to lock up more black and brown people, even at, as we were at historic lows. I want to go back to 2010 and 2011, when we told folks, which is the numbers we're at about now, that we had better ways of dealing with this violence. And from 2010 to 2011 to 2018, we were fought all the way to becoming the safest city we had ever been and the safest in the nation.